Good afternoon and welcome to the first uh, financial literacy seminar of the series. I have been waiting all summer for the start of the financial literacy seminar series, both because I love the series, but also because we have a truly extraordinary speaker today. So we are delighted to have John Chauvin. I think you probably, most of you know him very well, but I'm just going to say a few words um, about John and in particularly the books he has written. Um, and that's why, you know, reading the title today, really you can see this wonderful trajector, trajectory of very important work. John Chauvin is the Trion Director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and the Charles Schwab Professor of Economic at Stanford. He's a senior associate at the Hoover Institution and also research associate at the MBR. But I love telling you the title of uh, the three books he has uh, written, The Real Deal, The History and Future of Social Security, um, The Evolving Pension System, and Putting Our House in Order, A Guide to Social Security and Healthcare Reform. And that's why we are so excited today to be here and listen to this uh, new work that is doing Trying the Impossible financing 30 years retirement with 40 year careers. A, dis a discussion of social security and retirement policy. John, we are very excited to have you. This uh, is going to be kind of a two part talk. Uh, and if this works, the two parts, there's kind of a macro part and a micro part. Now macro does not mean the kind of macro that the Federal Reserve works on. It's nothing to do with unemployment or monetary policy. But it just means economy-wide issues. Uh, it means what policies might we change at a national level. Uh, and then the micro is, you know, what should you or your parents do about uh, uh, claiming Social Security and using their 401k? It's kind of the individual. What's the, uh, what's the efficient plan for an individual to get the most they possibly can uh, out of their assets? And I'll devote about a third of my time to part one and about two-thirds of my time uh, to part two. So part one is called Adjusting Institutions for Longer Lifetimes. And the first thing I want to ask is, are longer lifetimes, a lot longer lifetimes, is that reality or is that wishful thinking? Are people really living a lot longer uh, than uh, than they did uh, a couple generations ago or not, and just how much different uh, is it? And so this is a graph that I like to uh, illustrate the change is the beginning. We're going to build this graph up. Uh, but this is for 65-year-old uh, men in 1955. And uh, this is the probability of celebrating uh, future uh, birthdays for 65-year-old men. So they have a 100% chance of celebrating their 65th birthday, because that's kind of how we selected it. But they only had about a 40% chance of celebrating their 80th birthday. And that's how you read this uh, chart. Uh, and I'll pick out a few points. Um, in 1955, 65-year-old men had a 50% chance of reaching 77 and a half. In other words, they had a 12, 50% um, chance of living another 12 and a half years. Uh, another way to say that is they had a 50% mortality rate over 12 and a half years. Half of them died in less than 12 and a half years, and half of them lived beyond uh, 12 and a half uh, years longer. And then uh, the chance of making 85, conditional that you made it to 65, in 1955, you have about a 20% chance of reaching uh, 85. And the chance of reaching 90 was actually pretty small at 8.8%. Uh, 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 so that's how you read this uh, line. So what does it look like, or what more accurately does Social Security think it looks like for 65-year-old men uh, today? Is it much different? And well, oh, by the way, there's a picture of a 65-year-old man in 1955. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was 65 in 1955. So was Groucho Marx, but I decided to 
use the president instead. <laughs> Eisenhower actually had a heart attack three weeks before his 65th birthday, but he lived to about 79 or so. Um, <coughs> here it is today. Uh, it's only two generations later. I would say this is a rather drastically changed survivor uh, curve. So uh, instead of having uh, a 50% chance of dying in 12 and a half years, you've only got a 25% chance of dying in 12 and a half years. Uh, in other words, the 12 and a half year mortality is half of what it used to be. It used to be 50%, now it's 25%. Uh, chance of dying in 12 and a half years. Uh, if you did make it 12 and a half years, it used to be that another 60% died before uh, they reached uh, 85, uh, but now only one third uh, of those who make it to 77 and a half die before uh, reaching 85. So a 60% hazard became a 33% hazard. Uh, so uh, basically, Instead of 20% of 65-year-olds making it to 85, 50% uh, make it to 85. So I'd say this is a pretty dramatic uh, change uh, in just two generations on the uh, birthday probabilities for men. 30% chance now make it to uh, 90 instead of 8.8% uh, making it uh, to 90. And so, um, but say we focus for just a second on, you know, the median uh, age at death, uh, well, that is now a 60% increase in remaining life. Uh, it's 20 years instead of 12 and a half. And so if you divide, you know, 20 by 12 and a half, you get 1.6, 60% uh, longer. In other words, the median person gets 60% more checks if they have an annuity starting at 65. Uh, so I'd say it's a big difference. So what I'm saying is living longer is reality. Uh, obviously, not everybody lives longer, but uh, I, can't, I, I find that a pretty dramatically different uh, chart. Obviously, the 40-year mortality is unchanged. It's 100%. Uh, but the 20-year uh, mortality has changed dramatically. The 12-year, 12 and a half-year mortality has changed dramatically. So here it is for, oh, there's a 65-year-old man today, just a random guy I, I found. Uh, some of you may recognize him. Uh, that's Bruce Springsteen. Then what about uh, women? Well, uh, the green line was women in 1955, and the purplish line is women uh, Today, and 65-year-old uh, women today have a 40% chance of reaching 90, and a rather uh, uh, remarkable 5.6% uh, chance of reaching 100. And these are the so-called intermediate cohort forecasts by Social Security. Um, and so uh, there's a uh, random 65-year-old woman in 1955 uh, not even an American, actually, but one of the more famous women born in 1890 was Agatha Christie. And uh, then uh, I have on high authority that Meryl Streep has not had plastic surgery, and uh, that's a random 65-year-old woman uh, today. And so, but despite, you know, this being kind of a slick graph, there's actually a lot of information in it. Basically, mortality rates in the 60s and early 70s are half what they used to be. Uh, I did ask whether these four people are really the same age, uh, and uh, looking at them, they don't look like the same age. And I would say the right answer to that question is no, they're not the same age. They're all 65. They're all the same distance from birth, but they're quite different distance from death. Uh, so maybe we just don't define age correctly, so that's what I say here. They're all 65. But no, they're not the same age. 65-year-olds uh, today are significantly younger than they were 60 years ago. Their mortality rates are about half. And for at least for men, uh, the um, uh, average, or I'm being a little sloppy between average and median, uh, but uh, uh, length of remaining life is uh, up uh, dramatically, has increased about 60%. So longer lives are uh, a reality. Now what about adjusting institutions? Well, what I mean by adjusting institutions, 
Most of I mean retirement institutions. Uh, if people are living that much longer, then we may have to adjust uh, retirement institutions. Before we do that, though, maybe we should look at couples, because most people, when they arrive at retirement age, are married. And they're not so interested, or they're not only interested in, OK, what's my ex life expectancy? What's your life expectancy? But they're interested in, how long does our money have to last? Namely, they're interested in, how long is the survivor amongst us going to live? The second to die. When's the second death going to occur for this couple? Well, let's take the couple in the third row, the 64-year-old man married to a 62-year-old uh, woman. Those are both kind of the average age of retirement today in the United States, 64-year-old men, 62-year-old women. And uh, what these numbers say is that in the expected first death is in about 16 years, and the sec sec expected second death is about 27 and a half years into the future. But of course, people have, a, there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, when these deaths occur. These number in parentheses are how long do the luckier ones amongst the couples live? It's not like the luckiest. It's just, uh, what if you're in the 10th percentile? So you live longer than 90% of your cohort and 10% live longer than you do. Well then, you get a number for the second death of 35 years. And in fact, all these numbers in parentheses are essentially 30 and up. And that's where I get this, we're trying to finance 30-year retirements. Because if you don't use an annuity, you've got to be prepared to be lucky and live a long life. So 30 years is, is what you need to be prepared for, at least. Um, so that's, uh, oh, by the way, uh, when Sita and I did this, I think we were a little surprised, I was surprised, at how long survivors outlast their spouse. 10 or 11 years is the average length of widowhood in this country, and I'm using widowhood generically. It could be the man's outliving the woman, it could be the woman's outliving the man, probably is two-thirds or three-fourths of the time the woman outliving the man. But this sort of single period of life it's pretty lengthy, uh, 10 to 11 years on average, uh, that the survivor outlasts the first death. OK, so now what institutions are we going to adjust? Well, this just reviews kind of what we've already said. Average age of retirement is 64 for men, 62 for women. They need to prepare for at least 30-year retirements. Um, uh, just mentioning that this uh, widowhood can last about 11 years. But then I have this, uh, uh, if this was a song, this would be the, uh, you know, the, the phrase that keeps repeating, you can't finance 30-year retirements with 40-year careers. And how long could these people have worked who are retiring at 62 and 64? About 40 years. And you can just, I don't have the mathematics here, but you know that you're going to have to save an un-American amount of money. Uh, to finance a 30-year retirement with a 40-year career, uh, like a third or something like that of your uh, money. Uh, and uh, it just won't work. And it won't work for Social Security. It won't work for uh, public pensions of the state and local governments. It won't work for 401ks. It wouldn't work for DB plans. I mean, all the kind of things we worry about, the switch from DB to DC, um, or the expense ratios in uh, assets. I mean, they're all minor compared to this trying the impossible, which is to finance 30-year retirements with 40-year careers. So what can you do about it? Well, I, this just kind of says that this is part of what's behind the state and local government pension problems. It's part of what's behind Social Security's trust fund being in trouble and, and running out of money in 2033. Uh, it's uh, Obviously, with these long retirements, we have fewer workers relative to retirees. And simply, if we try to stretch our money uh, over these uh, very long retirement periods, we have a lower standard of living uh, during retirement. So um, this is kind of the macro warm up. Um, I think the easiest solution, uh, and it's a solution that may take 30 or 40 years to get to, but is working longer. Uh, 
you know, uh, like if you look at even Social Security's uh, problem, I mean, the, 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 there's only three possible solutions, higher taxes, lower benefits, or working longer. Working longer seems to me like the uh, least objectionable uh, course to go. For instance, I mean, basically what I'm saying is that many Americans now uh, can look at 70 years as adults. I'm talking 20 to 90. And splitting those 70 years, 40 and 30, just won't work. And so moving more towards 50 and 20, maybe 48 and 22, might work. It, it, things improve a lot. The mathematics improves a lot if you just delay uh, retirement. And so I tell today Stanford, or for that matter, GW undergraduates, uh, 70 is probably going to be uh, for you what 62 and 64 is today. Uh, and by the way, this is a global problem. Uh, it's uh, last month I was in China. Uh, China has crazy retirement ages in my opinion. I don't know quite what the job classifications are, but women face two different uh, retirement ages, both of which are ridiculous, 50 and 55, depending on their job category. Uh, men, it's 60. All of those strike me as having to have major, major adjustments. Uh, last spring, actually this spring, I was in England and I was uh, kind of startled to learn that the full retirement age for women in the last 10 years has gone from 59 to 66. Uh, and a lot of countries are moving in this direction and I think we're going to have to move. And we're not in the worst of shape. Uh, we actually, Americans work longer than many peoples already. Uh, we probably have less adjustment, but we're still going to have to adjust. Then I have a, some preliminary ideas, or I should say Seed and I have some preliminary ideas. We haven't really worked out all the uh, details, but there are a bunch of kind of hidden government policies which actually are early retirement incentives that we should get rid of, I think. One of them is just the way Social Security calculates its benefits and taxes. Uh, as you all know, it really only uses 35 years in the calculation of benefits. It's your best 35, but it's only 35. And so by the time a worker reaches age 60, if they haven't had a long work interruption, they've got their 35 years under their belt. They may even have knocked out some of their early low earning years with higher earning years. But, but at that point, they can work more, but their benefits are pretty well done. They're locked in. And so we've turned Social Security at that point into a pure tax on work. The Social Security tax, you pay more taxes, you don't get more benefits. Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, we've thought of, well, what about introducing a new category of worker called paid up? And so, you know, I haven't worked out the details, but one possible set of details would be, uh, we're gonna count 40 years of work towards benefits, uh, and after 40 years of work, uh, your benefits are kind of at the max, but then uh, further work will not incur any payroll tax for you or your employer for Medicare or Social Security. Your lifetime paid up after 40 years of contributions. So that would make working that 41st and 42nd and 43rd year, by the way, I'm in my 42nd year at Stanford, so this is very self-serving, um, except I don't think you'll get it in place in time for me. Um, but anyway, that's a 15.3% wedge uh, between what the employer uh, pays and what you receive that would be taken out. Uh, it would make working more uh, rewarding and therefore you might get more labor force participation. You're removing a tax on work. Um, you also could change the way Social Security benefits are calculated in a way that every year counts the same. Right now, uh, Social Security mixes up the way it treats its low earners with the way it treats short careers. And you could have special treatment for low earners per year, but not mix it in with short careers. So short careers actually get a better return than long careers in Social Security. And so, uh, just not without going into the details, the red is what we propose. Every year is the same, that is the slope is the same of this red line, and then at 40 it caps out, compared to the blue, which is the current standard. And notice that 
the long time workers get more in the red and the, uh, they get less if they're a short career person. So let's make working longer pay. So that's the basic idea behind this one. Uh, reward longer careers more uh, and, uh, and keep the slope the same for working an extra year. Okay. Second macro kind of policy is back in 1983, we changed Medicare. And I think we should change it back to the way it was before. What we did is we, there, Medicare used to be, well, let me say what it is. Medicare now has a, a policy which is called Medicare as a secondary payer, which means that if you work for an employer with 20 or more employees, Medicare, you don't get it. Even if you're 65, even if you've worked 10 years, uh, the Medicare guys say, oh, you and your employer can provide, you have to receive the same plan that every other employee of that firm uh, receives. And uh, we're a secondary payer, which is a code of saying we're not paying. Uh, uh, you, will, you, your Blue Shield, Blue Cross, whatever it is, at your employer will take care of you. So basically the deal is if you don't work, we'll give you Medicare, and if you do work, we won't. So it's a tax on work, a major tax on work. Um, we had the opposite program up until 1983, which is called Medicare as a primary payer, which means you get Medicare whether you work or not. So just imagine if you had that, you're 65, you go to your employer and say, don't worry about major medical, I got it, because I'm on Medicare Part A. So I got that, you don't have to take care of that. And by the way, I'm paid up. You don't have to pay any payroll taxes either. Uh, well, you'd, be, you'd be, have a much nicer offer. They'd be much more interested in hiring you. By the way, it wouldn't necessarily cost the government money. It would cost Medicare money, but the gov if you do work more, you're going to pay more income taxes. So one of the government's pockets is going to have more cash, and another pocket's going to have less cash, and you'd have to work out how it all nets out. Uh, we did a back of the envelope calculation. It kind of looked like it knitted out just fine. That didn't cost anything. Uh, depends on the labor supply elasticity to the higher wages that would exist if you uh, had Medicare as a primary payer and if you had paid up, they'd be a lot higher uh, wages. So um, uh, I think we've more or less covered uh, that idea. Here's the third idea. This is the schedule of uh, benefits that someone might get from Social Security depending on what age they started. This person at 66 gets 2,000 a month. But at 62, they get 1,500. And at 70, they get 2,640. And it's darn close to a straight line. You get more if you start later. Okay. That's fair enough. Uh, and then, for almost historical reasons, the government points out one point on that line and says that's the full retirement age. Well, what's special about that point? There's nothing special about that point. Uh, guess what? There's actually a bunch of people who retire at that age, as if it's just being suggested to them by calling it the full retirement age. So that suggests maybe we could change that and just make the full retirement age the age at which you get the maximum benefits. Don't change anything re economically. Leave the schedule exactly the same. Uh, or you could just call this the, ma the you know, maximum benefit. This is the minimum benefit, and people could choose. But why have this uh, so-called full retirement age? I know it's where the PIA formula uh, is uh, geared, but it's, to me, it's totally arbitrary. Uh, and it's amazing that you have that spike of retirements uh, at uh, a nothing special age. There's nothing particularly special about 66 compared to 65 and 11 months or 66 and one month, but nonetheless, you get extra retirements just because you called it the full retirement age. So maybe we should just change what we call the full retirement age. Uh, and that's a behavioral idea, and I'm not a behavioral economist, but uh, uh, what I've learned but through osmosis, hanging around some of the guys, is how you frame things matters. And this is a framing uh, question. 
why not have the full retirement age correspond to the maximum monthly uh, benefit? It's just changing the words. Yeah? If you go to 71 or 72, it, it stops off? Or? Well, right now, Social Security only uh, benefits only go up to 70, and you basically have to start at 70. Uh, you know, those ages, by the way, uh, have, have not changed for a long time while mortality has improved. You could think of allowing people to uh, delay even longer than 70, but we haven't done that. I guess this is just going to be a summary. Change Social Security to a paid up uh, with this new paid up idea. Change Medicare with the Medicare as a primary payer idea. Change the full retirement age. Uh, here's a slightly new idea, but I, I do know that workers are quite interested in part-time opportunities uh, uh, as they approach retirement. Maybe that could be uh, facilitated in some way. Um, I also think if people are going to work till 70, it's hard to believe that their education is complete at 21. Uh, so maybe we need a retraining program at 50 or some age like that. Uh, and uh, I don't know that much about the Japanese labor market, but the Japanese do live a lot longer than Americans. By a lot, I mean four years longer. And they actually retire shorter than Americans. They work longer. Uh, so maybe we should look at what they're doing. Uh, there aren't too many things we want to copy about the Japanese economy, but maybe we should at least know what's going on uh, there. OK? So that's what I've got for part one. And I don't try to hide the fact that this is a two-part talk that I smooshed together. Uh, so this is the title slide for the second part of the talk. Uh, Sita's name should have been on both parts of the talk. Uh, so there's a couple of things I'm going to say about this slide. First of all, we call it efficient retirement design. And uh, um, by efficient, we mean what the economists mean by efficient, which is don't leave money on the table. Uh, and uh, how do you combine your private assets and Social Security to maximize your retirement resources? At this point, this picture is just a design but it will show up again in a minute. So you can take this like the cover of a book, and that's just a kind of an artist rendition. Uh, I did want to uh, thank both the Social Security Administration and the Sloan Foundation for uh, support for this work. Uh, they've both been generous, and I think that Social Security uh, deserves special uh, thanks in the sense that um, you know, they support which I, what I hope they think is good research, but they really keep their hands off. They don't tell you, you know, you better find this or you better conclude that. Uh, and I found it pretty exemplary, actually, in uh, working uh, with them. Okay, so this is the second topic. This is the micro topic. Uh, and before we talk about efficient retirement design, we like to talk about prevalent retirement design. That is, before we talk about what people should do, let's talk about what they do. And uh, this graph, in a way, tells it all, which is they go get the money from Social Security as fast as they can. This is the months of delay between either age 62 or retirement and when they start their Social Security. And you can see all the high bars are at zero, one, and two months. And there's essentially no bars out there at the 96 months or to 72 months, or you can defer for up to 70, uh, 96 months, eight years, but nobody's doing it. Uh, so um, that's what people do. They start their Social Security as soon as they can. Um, there's a little bit of uh, uh, echo at 36 months. Uh, maybe that's three years. That's probably at 65. But uh, uh, there's just not much going on uh, other than get it as soon as you can. OK, what could people do? Now, we saw what they did. Well, what they could do is first just separate the decisions. When do I retire and when do I start Social Security? Treat them as two separate decisions. It looks as if people treat them as the same decision. Retire, start Social Security, it's all the same thing. Um, and they could separate these decisions, make two decisions. They, the reason they might think about doing it is that Social Security benefits are increased the later you start them. The monthly benefit is increased for later commencement. And uh, if you decide you're going to retire and start your benefits later, that's an alternative use 
for your 401k or private assets. In other words, you may have been thinking of your private assets as a, uh, the source of a supplement, a second check, if you like, to your Social Security, but maybe you're thinking wrong. Maybe what you should think of it as, this is what I can spend to get, to, so I can defer my Social Security. What we used to call it is, uh, instead of accessing both of these sources of income in parallel, you should do it in series with the 401k first and the Social Security uh, second. Uh, you should finance the delay. So don't supplement Social Security, defer Social Security with your 401k, or at least that's worth investigating. Yes? Does it depend on the rate of return you're getting? Absolutely. So let's look at that rate of return. Uh, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on the rate of return you're getting. It depends on your life expectancy. It depends on interest rates. And of course, it depends on the rules, which is kind of the rate of return you're getting. So this one kind of gives you some guidance as the rate of return you're getting. And uh, this is an old-fashioned chart. But uh, for those of you who remember maps, you know, before, uh, before Google and an iPhones, and, but I'm talking about AAA maps, uh, they used to have a little table. And it says a bunch of cities on the horizontal axis and a bunch of cities on the vertical axis. And it told you how many miles there was between those two cities and how long it would take you to drive. Well, this is like that, except it's deferring from, deferring to, uh, and it tells you what percentage your benefits would go up, uh, monthly benefits, if you did these deferrals. So for instance, if you deferred from 62 to 65, your benefits go up 24.44%. If you deferred from 62 to 70, this is the biggest number on the chart, it uh, goes up 76 percent. And if you think of the diagonals, these are all the amounts you get for one year of a deferral. And the second diagonal is all the amounts you get for two years of deferral. The third diagonal is what you get for three years of deferral, the fourth for four, the fifth for five, six, seven, eight. So this is the, uh, now by the way, this is what you get if you're married, if you're a, a single woman, single man, same schedule. No insurance company would ever do this, by the way. Some people are eligible for a joint survivor annuity. Some get single life annuity. They all get this exact same schedule, at, at essentially at the same price. So obviously, it's going to be a better deal for some than it is for others, depending on your circumstances. Yep. It's a great point. While you're delaying, you not only get these credits, but you get inflation adjustments. So if you literally adjusted, didn't take your 62 benefits at 62, you took them at 70, you get 76% more just for the delay, but you might get 21% more in addition to that because of the accumulated eight years of inflation. You're getting inflation adjustments while you wait. These are real benefits. Okay. Now obviously at 70, the rest of your life is shorter than it was at 62. Uh, so that's a factor you've got to think about. Uh, but because of the stuff we looked at in the, a minute ago, uh, it's not as much of a shorter factor than it used to be because people are living so much longer. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. These are not the, these are in some sense gross rate of returns, not net rate of returns. You'd want to calculate uh, what you've given up, of course. The, the, you don't get these for free. You're absolutely right. Nobody is getting 8% uh, a year real for deferring. Uh, I think the highest we get is in the 5.5 to 6 range, and that would be for the most favorable case, which would be the high earner in a couple. But you're right. You have to factor in uh, what you're giving up to get these. Absolutely. Is there, is there an explanation for why, if I look on the diagonal, yes. the numbers look almost random? Uh, it's funny. They piece together this schedule over many, uh, many years. Let me just give you a quick story about that. The first time there was any choice of when you started your Social Security benefits was 1956. And it was for women. 
And starting in 1956, women could, ch ch could choose to start their Social Security benefits any time between 62 and 65. And they decided that there would be a five-ninths of 1% a year deduction for every month you started before 65. Okay? And that, by the way, if you multiply five-ninths of 1% times 36 months, it's a 20% reduction for the three years, if you, if you start as early as possible. Well, guess what? That was 1956. 2014, the first three years of early retirement from the normal full retirement age, it's five nights of 1% a month. It's still the same deal it was back in 1956. Um, so if it was actually fair in 1956, with 1956 mortality and 1956 interest rates, it's, you know, you'd have to relook at it today because things have changed a lot, but that has not changed. The deal hasn't changed. But then they added some other things. They, they then, uh, now you can retire four years early. Before it was only three years early. Now you can retire up to four years late. They pieced together these, uh, uh, this thing. And so, it, you know, the numbers aren't, uh, I would say, not random, but they're not the same. You're right. Uh, these kind of average about 7.5%. These average, I suppose, about 15 to 16. You know, it, it, yeah, there, there is some fluctuation. It's just because they pieced the law together over time. Another factor that's uh, really important in this choice is, you know, what interest rate would you use to discount benefits or, for that matter, what interest rate could you earn on a safe government inflation index security. Uh, so this uh, particular chart, I think CETA probably more appropriately uses 20-year tips. I've got 10-year tips. They would follow the same pattern, but the 20-year tips might be a 20 basis points higher. But b the basic point here is when Social Security designed its actuarially fairness in 1956, they used a 2.9% real interest rate. And uh, they used, obviously, the mortality tables of 1956. Well, we've only had a 2.9% interest rate one month in the last uh, many years. But the mo main point is that interest rates for a long time averaged about 2%, at least at the 10-year. And now they're at uh, about 40 basis points, 0.4%. They had a spell where they were negative there. Uh, but interest rates are really low. Low interest rates encourage deferral. Uh, as well. When you think about private annuities, you can go online and price out a private annuity. Private annuities have become more expensive because of low interest rates. But Social Security annuities, basically when you defer, you're buying a larger annuity. The prices have not changed because of the low interest rates. So <laughs> suddenly you're, you're, you're getting a good deal and it's not marked to market in some sense. So the low interest rates, the better mortality, and the rules have changed in a favorable way, all of which lead to deferral being a pretty good uh, deal. Uh, you've probably had uh, almost enough of this stuff. This is a single men and single women and what their life expectancy is at various ages. For, for instance, 64-year-old men basically have a life expectancy of 20. Uh, and the number in parentheses is, again, kind of the 90, 90th percentile lucky ones. And then over here is the single women and uh, so forth. Women do live longer than men. And so for single people, it's more important that women defer than men. But it's a good deal for both at current interest rates. Um, one of our biggest conclusions is that Social Security's rules are a little uh, complicated, but they really favor deferring uh, the benefits for the higher earner in a couple. And this is kind of really important. Uh, and the reason it's important is the following. Some of you know this, probably not all of you do. How do couples' benefits work when you're married? Well, while you're both alive, you basically get the same benefits you would if you were each single. You get what I'll call B1 plus B2. B1 is what the first person would get if they're single, and B2 is what the second person would get if they're single. It's not quite that simple, but that's basically how it uh, works, um, if they both have long careers or reasonably long careers. But what happens if 
when one of them dies. <coughs> well, when one of them dies, the survivor gets the larger of the two benefits, regardless of who it is who died. So let's say that B1, by definition, is the larger benefit. B1 is going to last for both lifetimes, and B2 is only going to be effective until the first death. So the way to think of it is B1 is a second to die annuity, and B2 is a first to die annuity. The difference in length is 10 or 11 years. We saw that already. So that's the one you want to defer. You want the higher earner in a couple to defer because the benefit, that higher benefit's going to last a long time because it's going to be enjoyed by both people for the rest of their lives. And uh, so that's, so the survivor benefits are based on the higher of the two individual benefits. Uh, they're paid out as a second to die annuity. Uh, even after deferring, it, that, that can last for 22 to 25 years. Uh, and the lower earner's benefits, um, it's not so important to defer those. It's actually pretty close to a wash. It's pretty close to actuarially fair when you start them. So you're not hurting yourself much if you start them at 62. In some cases, it pays to wait till 70, but not much. It doesn't pay much. It, it, you know, it, it, the first to die annuity is sufficiently short that the years you give up are, you know, are kind of worth the gain that you're getting from the higher benefits. It kind of doesn't make much difference. Uh, so it, it, to, to oversimplify, for couples, it's the higher earner who should be uh, deferring. The lower earner can take the money whenever they want. Um, uh, the rules are complicated. Uh, we, here we talk about if a higher earner does tend to defer till 70, he or she could get uh, spousal benefits at 66. Uh, if their spouse is collecting their record, the higher earner can collect at full retirement age, 66, a spousal benefit based on their lower earner spouse, lower earning spouse, and they're actually collecting Social Security, but they're deferring their own benefit. So they're still getting these deferral credit. So that's uh, part of a strategy. Um, it's almost always part, one or the other should be collecting a spousal benefit, probably. Um, here's a point that I, my bet is lots of people miss. Many single elderly people uh, weren't always single, and they could be collecting on their ex-spouse's record for a while while they defer their own. Uh, their ex-spouse may have be deceased, maybe they were married 10 years or longer, they can access that account uh, and then switch to their own at a later point in life. So even single people can do this uh, changing around. So there's a lot of, um, uh, knowing the rules does help. Here's a suggested strategy at this point. We'll talk some more, but uh, single men in average health uh, should defer uh, somewhere between 68 and 70. I'm being rough, but basically, there's a payoff to deferring. I mean, it gets pretty flat at 68, 69, 70. It's about the same, so take your pick if you're not worried about just the, the dollars and cents. If, you, if you're worried about the, you know, you don't want to leave 10,000 on the table or 5,000 on the table, but 100 or 200, you don't care. So I'm just saying 68, 69, 70 is pretty flat, but get, you want to get to that far for single uh, men. Uh, for single women, uh, actually 70 is the best, uh, most valuable uh, time to uh, collect your uh, Social Security. Uh, the higher earner in um, a couple should defer to 70 unless both spouses are in bad health. Because let's say you have a situation where the husband's the higher earner, husband's in so-so health, they're diabetic. Uh, the, the wife is in great health. Well, if the husband's a higher earner and he defers, even though his life expectancy may be subpar, uh, that benefit's going to last a long time because it's going to be enjoyed by his spouse. Uh, so it still pays to defer if you can. Uh, when the lower earner starts benefits, doesn't have make much difference. And you know, obviously, if we were doing this to the penny, it does make a difference. But but for the big stuff, it doesn't. Here's, I've rounded these numbers off, but here's how much money is at stake in following these strategies uh, compared to the usual uh, approach. Uh, if you're single, 
on your low income, this is a low income column for single people. Uh, by low income, I mean somebody with about a $40,000 income today in today's dollars. Uh, and so they can make anywhere from forty dollars to $85,000 by following our strategy, uh, depending on whether they're a man or a woman in good health or average health. And then here it is for uh, uh, people at higher income levels, uh, quite high income levels, you know, more than, say, 110000 a year, 120000 a year. There's the numbers. Uh, so, you know, around 100000 bucks for a single uh, person. And then here they are for married couples, and you can see that uh, it's quite possible to pick up anywhere from $125,000 to $270,000. So these are non-trivial amounts of money. These are bigger than your average 401k balance. Uh, so uh, I think the next thing to do is let's look at a case study, and then I'll get, uh, begin to get ready to wrap it up. Here's a case study. Here's a husband and a wife. They're both 62. They both want to retire. I'd love to talk them out of it, but they want to retire. Uh, they're uh, middle-income folks, uh, about a $55,000 average income for the husband and about a $42,000 average income for the wife, uh, so $97,000 family income. They've tried to save, and they've saved a quarter of a million dollars. Okay? Uh, and. Uh, so the common strategy would be to start Social Security immediately at 62, and then try to supplement with their 250,000. Really, if that's your strategy, the best thing you can do is to buy an annuity for $250,000. That's the only secure way that your money's going to last the rest of your life, and you really can't get more per month in a sustainable way than that. And most people won't do that, but this is the best supplemental strategy they can come up with but it's still not the best strategy. The best strategy, uh, what we want to call the optimal strategy, is the husband deferring to 70 and the wife to 66. Okay, so we're going to go through this case uh, a little bit carefully. Uh, so here's the standard strategy. Uh, and what's shown here on the purple bars is how much they're going to get from Social Security. And the yellow bars are how much they're going to get from Prudential or whoever the annuity uh, supplier uh, is. And I think what you're supposed to notice is they start off making just a little under $4,000 a month. Remember, this was a $97,000 a year earnings couple. So they're making about 48, not a great replacement rate for them. But anyway, that's what they've got. And then if they were lucky enough to live uh, to uh, 90, uh, they don't quite make it up to $6,000. And the only reason this is climbing is the assumption of 2% inflation, the Federal Reserve's target rate of inflation. Nothing's changing other than that. Okay? So what could they do instead of that? Well, they could do this, which was that book cover slide uh, at the beginning of this segment. Uh, what they could do is live off their 250000 for four years completely, and notice that it still starts just under 4,000. In fact, it's exactly the same height. And uh, then at 66, the spouse starts her Social Security. The husband collects spousal benefits on her record. So the purple bars are the Social Security, but he has not claimed his record yet. And uh, they're drawing out their uh, 401k. These yellow bars at the top here are exactly the same height as they were in the previous strategy, conventional strategy. So for eight years, they're even. Their income at 62, 63, 64, 65, it's all the same, exactly the same. But notice that it bounces up at 70, and it stays ahead. And here is the gain. Now, the gain is zero for eight years, but then it, at 70, it pops up at 600 bucks a month. And it climbs up to more than 1400 bucks a month. And the reason it's climbing, and it's actually climbing faster, is that everything's indexed for inflation now, because the, uh, the Prudential annuity was not an indexed annuity. So everything's indexed. It's stepping up. And uh, so this is more. OK, but this is what they get when they're both alive. So what happens when one of them dies? Well, one of them dies, um, they're going to benefit 
from the deferrer who deferred till 70. We could talk if you want what happens if he dies before 70. But the blue bar now is everything you get with the conventional strategy, everything. Social Security, annuity, the whole works. And the yellow bars are the extra you get from adopting the 6670 strategy. And just eyeballing, you say, wow, you get an extra 25 to 30% more. The survivor has. Whenever the survivor kicks in, they just pick up this graph at that point, and they just go for the rest of their life. Uh, they, they get on this graph uh, whenever uh, the first death occurs. And so, if you just sum it all up, the couple has the same income for eight years. Then they get more as a couple. And then the survivor gets more, quite a bit more, 25 to 30% uh, more. The cost is exactly the same. And then I claim that maybe even the children would benefit, because at very old ages, parents often become dependent on children. Well, but if they have 25 or 30% more, survive, the, uh, the widows become dependent on children. But they're going to be less dependent, because they got more money from Social Security. So I'm claiming it's basically a dominance. The same, more, more is better than the opposite. Uh, yeah? John, just a quick question, maybe a word of caution. The question is, I assume these numbers you run in simulations do that both couples are the same age. These, this particular simulation does that. That's right. OK, because otherwise, if they're not the same age, you're worried about the gene filing for the younger spouse. And so they're hurting them a little bit. They won't file the spouse and then they can get the full money. So that's a cautionary note. Right. We've actually done some cases with, with age differences, but not this one. Okay. So then we had a little bit of talk about who should defer Social Security, and we come up with almost everybody. Now, obviously, there are people that shouldn't. Single people who have been diagnosed with cancer shouldn't defer. Uh, but in broad categories, we couldn't find anybody who couldn't defer. For instance, Single black men with less than high school education, we got they should defer till 68. Single men in poor health, you should think a smoker, 65 years old. Uh, you can kind of read them. Uh, single woman in average health, 70. Single woman smoker, 68. And you can read uh, couples, almost all primary earners to 70. Most non-earners, there aren't that many left in the, in, you know, in the family structure today, but if you're a non-earning spouse, you're not collecting in your own record. 66 is the right claiming age, and so forth. You, you can basically get it. But we get the, the vast majority of people should be deferring, and almost no one does. Yeah? Uh, are you always assuming they have some savings? Because they just borrow the amount of Yeah, uh, well, I'm also thinking these returns are sufficiently generous that they may, once they look at them, decide to work longer. Uh, but yeah, they either have to have financial assets or work longer. We actually have a project right now where we're trying to figure out how many people have the assets to do this. And I think we're going to get a substantial fraction, but it's, not, it's going to be less than half. I think, though, many people would react, if they knew how much more valuable the benefits were at 68 than 62, they might decide to work longer as w another way of getting them. OK. Yeah. Well, I think, why don't we ask that again in, in a few minutes. I'm going to look at, well, we'll give you a hint. I'm going to look at what would happen if interest rates went up. Does this, uh, does this um, strategy still work? So that will give you a, a, somewhat of a sense to your question. Uh, what if interest rates went up to 2.9%, real interest rates? Uh, obviously, it would take some of the steam out of it. But uh, so we'll look at that in a minute. Why has it become such a good deal? Well, I think the lower interest rates are a part of it, uh, definitely uh, an important part of it. The improved mortality is uh, part of it. Uh, the uh, rules, if anything, have improved, particularly for married couples. Uh, but the delayed retirement credits have, have um, become more generous in the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, the um, file and suspend rule that went into place in uh, 2000 was advantageous. So the rules have changed. So everything 
all three of these factors have made it more attractive. The rule changes, the interest rate changes, markets have made it more attractive, and the uh, uh, mortality changes have certainly. I was, uh, okay, this is going to begin to answer your question. Uh, CD, you'll recognize this chart. Um, uh, here's what's uh, actually uh, happened uh, for different birth cohorts. What's actually happened uh, to the advantage of following our strategy. For the 1930 birth cohort, uh, there really was, this is for single women, there wasn't much advantage, half a percent, they could gain half a percent. We wouldn't have written a paper about gaining half a percent or 0.7 percent or 0.8 percent, but it's gone up to 17.8 percent. So the combination of the interest rates, the rule changes, the mortality improvements uh, have made it very attractive. What this far column shows, I'm going to sneak in front of you, is what happens if you uh, kept the interest rate constant at 2.9%. And you kept the mortality rate. You gave everybody today's mortality uh, rates. Okay? So even the 1930 cohort had the mortality rates of the 1951 cohorts. The mortality is the same. The only thing changing are the rules. And you can see, uh, first of all, the rules haven't changed that much for single uh, women. And 3.8% became 49 But interestingly, even at 2.9% real, uh, there is an advantage to deferring, about a 5% advantage for single women of deferring. It's not the 17.8% it is today. It's 5%. But, you know, hey, if your Social Security wealth could be increased by 5%, that is uh, a non-trivial uh, amount. So it indicates that for single women, the rate of return exceeds 2.9%. That's basically what that indicates. Uh, now let's go to uh, the two-earner couple with a two-year age gap. So this is kind of like the example we just had. And notice that the combination of all the factors, the interest factor, the mortality factor, the rules factor, have turned what was a 1.2% gainer into a 21.5% gainer. And this, this summarizes the optimal age at which the higher earner and the lower earner should claim. Notice that the lower earner doesn't even have to participate in this deferring strategy. <laughs> and this flip to 70 here is not very important. Uh, it, it, it's not really uh, very uh, important. Uh, but what's really important is when the higher earner uh, claims. But all things considered, a 1.2% gainer has become a 21.5% gainer. But let's isolate on the rate of return question that you asked by saying, well, what if interest rates hadn't changed? They were always 2.9% real for every one of these cohorts. And what if mortality uh, was the same for all of them? In fact, it was the same as it is today. So even the 1930 cohort enjoyed today's mortality. So nothing's changing in mortality. Nothing's changing in interest rates. Uh, but the interest rate is 2.9%. Well, notice that deferring is still very, very profitable for the uh, higher earner, or for this couple, but it's mostly the higher earner. It's still a 12.2% return. The, uh, we've actually done some calculations. I think the rate of return you're looking for is around 5.5% uh, for this particular couple. Uh, so we haven't had real interest rates and probably won't anytime soon at that level. This is the one category, uh, the joint survivor annuity uh, being sold at the same price as the single annuity. Uh, this is the amazing deal, and it can withstand some pretty high interest rates. It's made better with low interest rates, but it works at high interest rates. Um, I was just going to uh, mention a couple of signs of progress that maybe the word's getting out. So being, uh, being able to foresee the future, I was going to quote next month's consumer reports. Uh, and uh, they have a title which is, Try to Delay Claiming Social Security. Uh, and it says, as the Social Security program is currently designed, 
Waiting to claim benefits is the best guaranteed retirement savings plan around. Workers who delay filing until they're, they're, they are 60, I think that should be they are, uh, and I think they had it right. They had T-H-E-Y, apostrophe R-E. They're 66, the full retirement age for those born between 1943 and 1954, increased their monthly benefits by 8% per year until age 70, or 32% over uh, four years. But filing early uh, reduces uh, benefits. Then they go, claiming benefits late wasn't the norm among our readers. They did a survey. I'd love to get my hands on this survey. Of those already retired, 55% had started taking benefits at 62. But 52% of those not yet retired told us they would claim their benefits at full retirement age. And an additional 29% said they'd wait even longer. So I thought that was good news that uh, some people are uh, saying, and so, uh, Consumer Reports is advising uh, uh, this delay strategy. Uh, uh, another journal of repute, uh, USA Today, September 6th, 7th edition, when to start Social Security. Use the proper start date for benefits. Assume that you have uh, sufficient income without starting your benefits at 62 your earliest date of eligibility when you get reduced benefits and uh, that your life expectancy is average or better, then delaying your start date can be a good investment. If you were born between 43 and 54, you can increase your monthly uh, payments as much as 76% based on when you start your benefits at 62 or 70, and that does not include any cost of living adjustment. So I thought, by the way, there's been articles in the Wall Street Journal, in uh, uh, Forbes, and other places. We're not the only one uh, uh, singing this tune. Larry Kotlikoff's been singing this tune. Several other people have been. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think anybody who looks at this carefully is going to come to the same conclusion, that this is actually the way to get more out of your retirement savings. And um, so, um, uh, the conventional or common strategy is the wrong strategy. So here's my final message. Um, working longer, I think, is inevitable due to dramatically longer lifetimes. Americans can't finance 30-year retirements uh, publicly or privately. Uh, secondly, there is considerable opportunities to use existing retirement assets and entitlements more effectively. Many retiring couples could enjoy an extra 100 to 200,000. I'm trying to be conservative because I could have pushed that to 270, I think, uh, of lifetime uh, consumption simply by efficiently using their 401k assets and deferring the claiming of uh, Social Security. I think that's my last slide. I'll hit the button just to see, but it is. Uh, so um, that's the story. Um, um, I did get a, a letter from somebody who said, you know, kind of more or less thanks to your work, I think I picked up an extra 150,000. So I thought that was a nice, uh, nice, uh, nice thing. Um, uh, but we'll see. Uh, I don't think this opportunity is going to disappear uh, soon. I, I'm not saying that if you're 20 or 30 that you should be planning on this. But if you're, uh, you know, 55 and above, I think this deal is probably going to be there for you and you should, uh, should, should take advantage of it. Um, uh, and, you know, interest rates will change, but I don't think uh, uh, in the big picture. And, you know, instead of getting 200,000, maybe you'll gain 110,000. Well, that's how it is, because uh, it is interest rate sensitive. But um, mortality has changed so much, and they have not adjusted. Uh, so that's the plan. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Uh, just a point. I, uh, I spent my working career in corporate America, and the issue around trying to work longer is inconsistent with what's happening in corporate America. As you get older and older, you become a much more expensive employee, so they're more interested in having you leave than stay. So that's, that gives me some concern. Uh, the other issue, uh, spending patterns themselves, as you get older and older, um, your, your spending typically starts to go down. So you need the money at the front end, not the back end. So just 
Okay, so those are good good points. It's, it's not, uh, yeah, I understand that you, you won't necessarily want a real level uh, income, and I certainly understand your point about corporate America. I do think part of corporate America, not all of it, but part of it is uh, essentially all of corporate America is uh, self-insured for health insurance. That is, they have an insurance provider, but it's experience rated on an annual basis. So if you have an expensive population, you're going to have expensive premiums uh, with a delay of a year. Uh, and uh, older workers are, uh, they may be other reasons, but one of the reasons why you don't want an older workforce <laughs> is it, it, it uh, does uh, change your uh, experience in terms of health costs. That would change with this Medicare possibility of going to Medicare as a primary payer. But your points are well taken, and I think we have to really think about uh, how to uh, deal with the uh, uh, demand side for labor, uh, that is the corporate demand for, for older uh, workers, and uh, I think there's a number of institutions that don't serve us well. Uh, um, possibly even, be, I, I want to be careful and look into this carefully, but you know, employers, if they think that there's a productive worker, but he's not as productive <laughs> as a younger worker, they can't easily pay that person less uh, without worrying about age discrimination. So they just not, don't hire them. Uh, so even age discrimination may backfire in, in, against the older worker. Um, but those are good points. Uh, I'm guessing everybody in this room works at an air-conditioned office. Uh, so it's one thing you tell us we're going to work until we're 70, but if you say the same to a construction worker or a firefighter or a beat cop, it's a, it's a different matter. Uh, yeah. Or I don't know, maybe as we live longer, maybe strength and vigor is lasting longer too. Spring team looked like he might be able to handle a construction job, but, uh, <laughs> but I wouldn't think Eisenhower. Yeah, I mean, I actually think uh, if we did look more carefully at Japan, we'd find that people change careers. That the career that they have in their 60s is not the career they had. It, it wasn't their career job, it's the second job. And it may be a lower paying job, and it may be a less physically demanding job, and it may have more flexible hours. Um, I, there's a lot to be thought through here. Uh, but I do stick, the, I don't claim to have the answer, but I do claim that this, something's got to give because we can't finance 30 year retirements with 40 year careers. That I do stand behind. But exactly how we should adjust to it, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it, we need a dialogue, and I actually think this is a problem to work on for the next 30, 40 years. And this, this is a problem of, of the first half of the 20th century, 21st century. One of the social security experts knows this, but if you see this presentation, you go back to your parents, say, and say, uh, gee, you could have had a V8, you could have, uh, you know, postponed, is that an option to reconsider? I think you can do the, say you're between 62 and 70, I know you can call up Social Security and say, stop my Social Security. And uh, say you're 66, and you'd like four years of deferral credit, and you'll restart at 70, and you'll get that four years of deferral credit. I also think, but I don't know, maybe you know, Sita, I think you can return up to one year's worth of benefits. So let's say you say, uh, I'm 66, I'd like to return my last year's benefits so I'll be treated as if I stopped at 65. I think you can do that as well. So that's what you can do. Uh, but if you want to, uh, obviously you, can't, you wouldn't stop if you're at 70. But if you're in the 62 to 70 range, you can get these deferral credits for a while, even if you've started Social Security. The, the, the main thing is call up and say, stop it. Uh, I'll start later. Again, I'll resume later. And you can pick up these credits. And then you may be able to, I think you can set the clock back one year if you send them a check. But I, I think you have to do that in 12 months. Yeah, I, I, I think that. Right, right. But the stop, you certainly can do the stop. Uh, you can be collecting benefits and say, uh, you just give me a pause for three years and I'll get three years of deferral credit. Some of the optimizations that you show, particularly with, with the couple and the red, the red and the, uh, the yellow bars, yes. those seem pretty complicated to me. 
um, particularly when you account for the optimal decumulation of assets. Do you have any thoughts on policy interventions to help people do this kind of optimization? So in other words, to choose the right claiming age and also the, uh, the optimal decumulation? Well, I share your, uh, your the preamble was, this sounds complicated. I share your view on that. Uh, I think uh, there are services. Some of them cost 50 bucks. Some of them cost, uh, yeah, to get advice. Some of them, there's various uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, I've mentioned uh, Kotlikoff has an outfit called ES Planner. I'm on the board of a company called Financial Engines. There are companies that, that will help you with this. They all charge you something, and you'd have to figure out whether it's useful or not to get their advice. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm not sure they all charge you. I, mean, I think you can get some free advice online. Uh, and uh, you know, you'd, you'd want to test and make <coughs> sure it's, uh, it's worth more than it costs. Uh, but, uh, but you're right, it's a, it is a little complicated. I don't know what to say. I, I think many people would need some help to do this strategy. Um, yeah, uh, in looking at the, the several things that you mentioned that near the start, uh, the changes in Social Security and Medicare, it strikes me that those were part of the effort to make these programs more means tested. That's true. And to that extent, the means testing is basically messing them up. Um, and, and so that's one thing I wonder if you could discuss. And, and secondly, uh, to the extent that people are retiring at 62 when it is not rational, assuming the program continues to exist, uh, how much are the scare stories that are floating around where, you know, lots, I mean, I talk to lots of young people and they're convinced the program will not exist when they retire. Um, and, can you, can you get a handle on that? Um, let's start with your first question. I, I, I'll only probably partially answer, but I'll, I'll do, do my best. Let's talk about Medicare as a uh, secondary payer. It's exactly what you suggested. Somebody came in and said, let's target our scarce dollars to the people who need it. And people who can have health insurance anyway, let's, you know, Let's target our dollars to people who wouldn't otherwise have health insurance. So that's a, a target. I don't know about means testing, but that's a targeted program. Uh, to target, be target efficient, you've got so much money, let's help people who otherwise would not have health insurance. So that sounds like a pretty good idea. Except any targeted program is going to have incentive effects. We, we all have seen this before. Uh, to uh, you know, to be in that target or whatever. That is, if they say the only way to get Medicare is not to have a job, not to be working, well, then people will say, okay, in that case, um, I won't work. I think work at 65 and 66 and 67 is much more optional than work is at 45 and 46 and 47. Um, you can do anything you want to a 45-year-old, and they're going to keep working. You tax them, you do whatever you do to them, they keep working. I don't think that's so true for 65 and 67-year-olds. And, and so I do think that there's a, a big distortion of that targeting. Uh, that's probably true on the uh, Social Security uh, one as well. But it, it does have that trade-off, that exactly what you're talking about. Um, remind me just a word about your second question. Uh, scare stories. Oh, I, I wonder myself what's causing people to uh, take their Social Security <coughs> as fast as they can. Uh, as the scare story's got to be part of it. I don't know. See, do we, we don't really have the answer yet, right? We're, 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 we're interested in this. Uh, we're interested. So do you, I'm sorry, I had that mic over here. Okay. It's on, but um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm four years removed from Social Security, but I still can't help making public service announcements. Uh, to answer your question of why 62, it's because the agency for the longest time, when you walked into a field office at age 62, they would say, take benefits now to be ahead for 14 years. As opposed to saying, if you live to 76, you'll be behind for the rest of your life. It's a message the agency is trying to change, and is doing it slowly, and now the message is basically take benefits when you need them. Uh, because remember, this is a social insurance program that's supposed to be insuring you against old age where you outlive your savings. 
So the idea is you should delay claiming until you need the money. If you're 62 and can't work and need it, you should take it. If you can delay to 70, you should delay. Um, and for, for those who don't realize, the ESP plan or the cost program is $149. Um, Social Security has an online calculator. It's free. Uh, check it out. And then there's also a two-page pamphlet called When to Start Receiving Retirement Benefits. Uh, it's worth Googling. It's just two pages, but it talks about these numbers, the 32% you get by delaying, the 25% haircut you get if you, delay, if you claim early, and things to consider, your health, your finances, uh, your spouse. Uh, again, it's a quick two-pager, and it's worth looking into. Good. Thanks. I, I think that's, that was terrific. Yeah. Uh, irrespective of Social Security's messaging, I believe that people have taken the 62 uh, option simply because folks believe, I don't know when I'm going to die, and I want my money in my hand to enjoy it now. I think we're overthinking this a little bit. It's either we're going to, it's instant gratification or delayed gratification. I don't care if you're 45 or 65, instant gratification still kind of works. And, and, and I've dealt with some of the messaging from Social Security. Some of the messaging is, messaging is just as cloudy and ambiguous. You can talk to them, you know, different people, different times, and it's like, what did you say? It's not clear or concise, and in the absence of clear, concise messaging, even when it's clear and concise, the bottom line is instant gratification. I mean, this is the United States. That's how we roll. <laughs> Good for you. If this is better for individuals, it's worse for the government, is that right? And how do we pay for this? So, uh, I'm not sure it's uh, worse for the government, but it might be. Uh, the following sense. If people, I think if people understood the way Social Security works today, with the mortality today, <laughs> today's interest rates, they would conclude that, uh, well, you get a lot more when you start Social Security at 68, 69, 70 than you do at 62, 63, or 64. Uh, their reaction might be one of two things. If they've got the money, they might say, well, I'll use my assets now to live on, and I'll uh, collect my Social Security six, seven, eight years from now. If they don't have the money, I think a rational person might look at this system and say, I'm going to work longer than I thought. I mean, the payoff of working, if that's what you have to do to get the delayed, uh, you know, if this Social Security really is worth a couple hundred thousand dollars more, starting it later for the higher earner, I don't know what, how much that higher earner is making per year, but that's a pretty nice supplement to the pay they're getting from working. They're, getting, they're earning a lot more if that's their means of delay. The government uh, comes out much different if they delay by working more. Uh, the IRS like collects more revenue. I mean, Social Security may lose in either way, but I'm worried about all the pockets of the government, not just the Social Security pocket. So I think a lot of it might be working longer, which I don't mind. Uh, so we haven't really worked it all out, but, but, but I think that if you were also, I mean, we've been framing it. I'm going to retire, what should I do? But you could start off, I don't know when I'm going to retire. Let's see how Social Security treats people who retire at 68 versus 62. I, I think you'd find a lot better. Uh, and so you take that into account, you might decide to work longer. You mentioned uh, Japan once or twice. Um, this may be a little bit out of left field, but if you were giving the same talk in Japan, uh, how would the recommendations be different or the same? Well, I, I actually, uh, in two, three weeks from now, I'm going to, uh, I commissioned a paper on Japan. So uh, I'm Bob Clark of North Carolina State University, any of you know him. Uh, uh, so I'll learn more about it. Um, uh, I mean, I think Japan has, a, has tremendous demographic challenges. They, they clearly do. Um, uh, I think they've, they've started to work on the answer. Namely, I mean, they are working longer. I don't know exactly. I don't think they're in the worst of all shape. I was surprised. I mean, I actually think, unless they make dramatic changes, I think one of the countries that's in the worst of all shape on these matters is China. Uh, I think they're in, uh, they've got, I think, crazy retirement ages. Uh, they're living almost as long as Americans. Uh, 
They've got very low fertility rates. They've got kind of a pay-as-you-go social security system. It's kind of, in a sense, it's not really national. It's more provincial and so forth. But their age structure is going to be so top-heavy. I, I think they're the ones that, I, mean, I talk about us working to 70. I mean, for them, which is another six to eight years, I mean, I think they need to work another 15 years. I mean, they, they just have uh, huge problems, I think. Uh, so I wouldn't pick on Japan as like the, the, the one with the worst of all problems. Um, I, I, I would, uh, I, I, I mean, it's just maybe it's just because I was there most recently, but I, I thought the Chinese demographics, had the, the hard part of it hasn't hit yet, but by 2050, they are substantially older than the U.S. Uh, and they've got, uh, I think, huge problems in caring for their elderly population. All right, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank John for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.